Well, um, hello uh, everyone and welcome to the Conservative Friends of Afghanistan. Um, thank you for joining this timely and much needed conversation on the future of the country. I'm Shabnam Nasimi, uh, the director of CFA. For those new to our work, the Conservative Friends of Afghanistan is a political, business and diplomatic forum aimed at building a more meaningful and stronger relationship between the UK and Afghanistan. We explore how to best build public consensus uh, and consent for the future of the uh, uh, Afghanistan and ensure that all voices are heard to ensure uh, a sustainable peace building and peace process. The intervention in Afghanistan uh, by the United States in 2001 triggered the hasty production of a large corpus of writings about the political and social, uh, social cultural, cultural dynamics of, of the country by Euro-American academics, travelers, journalists, uh, and aid and development workers. Afghanistan today is in a, in a very critical juncture once again. The US is less than 40 days away from the May troop withdrawal deadline, with many arguing that US withdrawal would lead to immense suffering in Afghanistan. Despite 20 years of international presence, countless lives lost and billions in aid, many still fear, uh, fail to understand Afghanistan and its history, and why there seems to be no consensus on the future of the country. We're honored here uh, today to have Professor Thomas Barfield with us, one of America's foremost authorities on Afghanistan. Professor Barfield is a professor of anthropology at the University of Boston, um, as well as the president of the American Institute of Afghanistan Studies. He's an anthropologist who conducted ethnographic fieldwork with nomads in Northern Afghanistan and uh, in the middle of 1970s, as well as a shorter period of research in China and post-Soviet Uzbekistan. He is the author of The Central Asian Arabs of Afghanistan, The Perilous Frontier, Nomadic Empires in China, and co-author of Afghanistan, An Atlas of Indigenous Domestic Architecture. Since 2001, his research has focused on the problems of problems of law and political development in contemporary Afghanistan. In 2007, he received a Guggenheim Fellowship that led to the, uh, the publication of his latest book, Afghanistan, a, a Cultural and Political History, which has become required reading for many university students and researchers when it comes to understanding the dynamic of Afghanistan. And without further ado, since you, um, Professor Barfield, doesn't need any more introduction, I've probably wasted much of our time. Um, welcome, Professor Barfield. Thank you very much. So myself and Professor Barfield will have a uh, discussion uh, and we'll open up to questions from the audience. So to the audience, whilst Professor Barfield and myself are speaking, please, please do submit your questions via the Q&A tab at the bottom of this screen. Um, let's start with your background and work on Afghanistan. Um, you mentioned in a United States Institute of Peace event um, a few years ago that uh, this is not the first time state building has been an, uh, important in Afghanistan, or that foreigners have thought this is how to bring stability, and that this will be, the um, I'm assuming, the fourth foreign withdrawal that the Afghans have seen with uh, a similarity that foreigners, you know, arrive uh, to Afghanistan to create a state um, and leave Afghanistan by letting Afghans run it the way they want, as long as it doesn't bother the rest of the world. Um, why do you, why, from your perspective, why do you think this happens? And if we re reflect on past mistakes, how can this time be different? And will this approach uh, change anything for Afghanistan? Well, the, the main reason is that foreigners entered Afghanistan usually for their own reasons. Um, Afghanistan was never successfully colonized, uh, so it doesn't have a colonial history. Um, but if we go back to the first two invasions in the 19th century, um, they're out of the British Raj in India. And fundamentally, um, they were not interested in Afghanistan per se, but protecting the frontiers of India. So it was always involved with that. And when it turned out that it was uh, after a couple of military disasters that 
it was going to cost much more to achieve this aim than the British were willing to put in. Um, they focused on Afghanistan playing the role of a buffer state between them and Russia, of expanding Russia. Uh, but they realized they didn't really necessarily need to occupy Afghanistan to do that. Uh, in the 20th century, we see the, the Soviets come in largely to help um, People's Democratic Party of Afghanistan that established a regime that was sort of falling apart. And at that time, uh, under the sort of the last years of, of Brezhnev, uh, the Soviet Union had declared that any country that entered the socialist bloc should not be allowed to leave it. So therefore, they felt they had a lot to lose. So they intervened again, kind of thinking, we'll restore order and go home. Their motto was Czechoslovakia, in and out in a summer. And they were there for 10 very destructive years before the Soviet Union itself changed. And Gorbachev decided it was not worth it was not worth it to stay there and essentially pulled everybody out. But, and this is important, everybody thought that regime would collapse. But like the British, essentially, if an Afghan regime had an international sponsor, it proved very difficult for rebels that had gotten the foreigners to leave to topple an Afghan government that had international support. So we're sort of in a, a similar situation now. The United States entered Afghanistan, not because it was interested in Afghanistan, and not even that the Afghans had done anything, but because Osama bin Laden and Al Qaeda were based there. They attacked Washington and New York. The US went in. Uh, like most imperial powers, when it enters, it kind of figures, let's rebuild Afghanistan to some extent in our own image. The British attempted to do that, the Russians attempted to do that, the Americans attempted to do that. I must say they often did this uh, with the help of allies within Afghanistan who thought this would be a pretty good thing. Um, but that turned that mission then in kind of less of a domestic uh, project than a foreign project. And um, failed to create states. So we're sort of in a similar position now, only to some extent it's taken the United States a little bit longer to kind of come to a conclusion of how do you create an Afghanistan that's acceptable to Afghans um, and leave a stable state behind. Um, we're, we're sort of at that stage now. In most cases in the past, what they did was dump the leader they had put into power and put another leader into power that was also foreign imposed, but essentially played Afghan national politics. Got the foreigners out, but kept their money. Um, that's what's happened. That's, that's one of the reasons Najibullah lasted much longer than people thought. So we're sort of in that position now where the big question is not so much the withdrawal of foreign troops as it is if the foreign troops go, does the money go? And the Afghan government is currently financed by international money but that's been true of previous Afghan regimes, but it might be able to survive the withdrawal of foreign troops. It cannot survive the, the, the cutoff of international aid. And many Afghans, I think, rightfully think if, if foreigners pull their troops out, will they be willing to pour in the billions of dollars they currently are to maintain stability in Afghanistan? Thank you, uh, Professor Barfield. Um, look, after, 20 years of, of US-led intervention in Afghanistan, billions in aid and countless lives lost. Um, the world is now willing to accommodate the very group they went in to fight, the Taliban. What is the nature of this insurgency group? Where, where do they come from? What are their principles? And what type of political accommodation, if any, can be ne negotiated with the insurgents? Well, it's 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 important to realize that the United States did not go into Afghanistan to fight the Taliban. It offered Mullah Omar, we will let you rule Afghanistan if you give us Osama bin Laden. And Pakistan told Mullah Omar, give him Osama bin Laden. And he didn't. So the Americans arrived 10 weeks, the Taliban are gone. But if we looked at in 2001, Al Qaeda was listed as a terrorist group. The Taliban were not. In other words, the US did not go to war with the Taliban. And in fact, probably in 2001 and 2002, it could have reconciled with them. There were many Taliban that were interested in joining the new government. Um, but again, like many outsiders, the US had a, sort of a Manichaean view of you're with us or you're against us and did not understand that just because some groups had been Taliban, they couldn't be something different later. Um, 
So uh, the United States never went into Afghanistan to build an Afghanistan. That project expanded over time. So uh, the, the whole question of, of, how the, of how the US intervention began is really important to understand is that fundamentally when the US came in, it didn't care what kind of country it was and would have happily let the Taliban continue to rule and abuse the Afghan people if they had thrown out Al Qaeda. They didn't. Once, once it's gone, history tends to be reinterpreted. And in particular, that the United States was there to you know, improve women's rights or to bring democracy or other things. It was clear at the beginning, the Bush administration wasn't interested in this at all. Um, but over time, this did become uh, a, a major project. Just because it didn't start that way doesn't mean that it, it couldn't become that. The, it's not clear exactly who the Taliban are um, in terms of the current uh, regime. Uh, there's Taliban that want their emirate back. Um, they say they want a strict Islamic government. On the other hand, you know, the Afghan constitution has always said Afghanistan is an Islamic republic. So it's a question of, so what kind of Islam are we talking about here? Um, but beyond that, in terms of the current uh, Taliban, remember the first Taliban, you know, were tearing pictures off of, of, of milk cans that of cow, you know, no picture. Today's Taliban has a robust media appearance. Obviously they changed in some ways. They've also become more nationalist because they have described themselves as driving out foreigners. They call that a jihad. But if all the foreigners leaving you and it's just Afghans killing Afghans, is that a jihad? Or are you actually gonna go to hell for that? Is that murder? Um, but if we look at it, many places in the country uh, like in the North, parts of the West, the original Taliban movement that was very heavily Pashtun, located in the East and the South. What's it doing in the North and the West? Obviously there's different people involved. So the question is how much of, uh, is the Taliban really a unitary force? Who are we actually negotiating with? I'm talking about the US and the international community. Those people sitting in Doha, who, who, what do they really represent? Because from my point of view, uh, maybe share with many Afghans, it's not necessarily shared by everyone, is that um, Afghanistan is in the midst of a proxy war and essentially the Taliban are a Pakistan proxy. My belief is that if it was a purely a domestic war, we could probably get a settlement in Afghanistan relatively quickly because there's a lot of issues that may be defined as, as pro-government or pro-Taliban, but they're in fact local. Like, whose land got stolen? Like, um, how are political uh, patronage being given out? Uh, the amazing thing about Afghanistan is the wake of, of almost of all foreign invasions is that Afghans themselves have been able to reconcile, even after the, the communist regime fell. The actual communist military units joined different Mujahideen units. You know, it was just a, it was a different kind of war. Uh, so one of the things that I think we have to understand here is, and I, and I think it's a mistake the United States is making, it is not really negotiating with an Afghan insurgency. It's negotiating with an, Af with, with, with an Afghan insurgency slash Pakistan proxy. And therefore the question of where Pakistan sits on this and whether it is willing to see peace with Afghanistan, I think is a major issue, which is one of the reasons that uh, I think it needs to be internationalized is because if the whole international community uh, wants to see peace in Afghanistan, and I think it does, because other than Pakistan, everybody else sees potential trouble in Afghanistan as trouble for themselves. Um, then perhaps countries like China and others that right now, the US is maintaining order in Afghanistan, but it lives on the other side of the globe. If there's trouble in Afghanistan, who borders Afghanistan? China has a little border in Xinjiang uh, with, with Afghanistan, which it is, is if anything, paranoid about a concern about the rise of a Muslim insurgency. Central Asia is very concerned about disruptions there. And if Central Asia is concerned, Russia is concerned. Does Iran really wanna see another um, uh, Sunni caliphate that considers uh, Shias uh, to be apostates arrive? There's a lot of good reasons that even countries that do not like the United States 
would like to see stability in Afghanistan. And so by making these negotiations bilateral, um, probably the United States is, is not really understood uh, the situation as it exists on the ground. Um, it's a good thing you mentioned Pakistan because um, uh, someone in the audience actually f wants to follow up uh, on this before I move on. They're asked why the US is, has turned a blind, blind eye on Pakistan's wrongdoings for the last 20 years and what is the reason that they haven't been um, punished for their involvement at least in supporting the Taliban over the last 20 years? Well, it's actually 30 years, all right? If, if you go back to um, when the Russians were in Afghanistan, it is true that the Americans and the Saudis supported the Mujahideen, but there wasn't a single American supporting the Mujahideen inside Afghanistan during the Soviet period. It was all handled by Pakistan's ISI. In other words, the Americans and Saudis provided the money, but the Pakistanis did the organization for that. That was acceptable to the United States at, at, at the time because they, were, they weren't really concerned you know, with, 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 with the aftermath. But why, particularly after 2001, um, uh, American administrations did not understand that Pakistan was not an ally. The Bush administration named it a major non-NATO ally so it could get better stuff. When in fact, it, it was a belligerent. Um, I can say partially stupidity, um, but it's, it's a long period of stupidity. It's, do remember, Pakistan is a nuclear power. There's 180 million people there. Um, it is all, it is, and, and it had a very long tradition as an American ally. And it sort of cashed in on that. Um, Afghanistan, you know, stayed out of all of these alliances. Um, so in, in, in some ways, American administrations, when they tried to understand Afghanistan, tended to ask the Pakistanis. That was not particularly smart, but that's what they did. So, and, and particularly during the Soviet war, um, all the aid coming through Afghanistan was coming through Pakistan. So if you were in Peshawar at that time, you had many people that were involved in the Afghan project, helping the Afghan Mujahideen that had never seen Afghanistan and never would. So from their point of view, Afghanistan was kind of part of Pakistan. And Pakistan at that time, very proudly and too, too much to the annoyance of the Afghans began referring to Afghanistan as its fifth province. And under the Taliban, it looked like it was beginning to achieve that uh, status. I believe, I don't know if it's still true at that time, Kandahar had a Pakistan area code for its telephones. Um, so, uh, but fundamentally, um, the US was not able to think through it's, it's policy options. But certainly many in the American military, the intelligence community and others certainly saw what the Pakistanis were doing. Uh, but it was always when it got to the top, when it got to the White House, when it got to the State Department, they always say, well, Pakistan has promised to do X, Y, and Z. Um, we need their cooperation. You're, you're sending, you're supplying your army through Pakistan. So, you know, you're flying your planes over their country. So it sort of set up a, 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 a dilemma. And it's, it's one that's until recently, I would say not been properly uh, weighed or balanced. Sorry, I was, I was on mute. Um, Afghanistan is very, it's a multi-ethnic multi -ethnic country and so far, no solution has been found to ensure equal representation of all groups. And this is one of the main grievances that we've heard, heard time after time. Aside from the insurgency and the counterterrorism and the security issues, ethnicity and civil conflict is a huge problem. What do you think, I mean, to what extent do you think a formal power sharing arrangement can work um, and whether that's possible through reforming the constitution? 
Well, you have to remember that the Constitution is essentially a copy of the King's Constitution from 1964. What it did was create, give a constitution designed for a king and call it a presidency. Um, the Afghan constitution gives Ashraf Ghani and Hamid Karzai before him the right to appoint every single governor, sub-governor down to the local level. So what does it mean if you're an Afghan in a rural area and you're told, yeah, you're gonna vote for somebody in parliament, you can vote for the president, but who's your governor? Do you have any control on him? He, your governor, your sub-governor, your police commander, these are the people that affect your daily life and they are almost invariably outsiders appointed by the palace in Kabul. And where does the loyalty lie? To the palace in Kabul. It's a patronage system. So it's not that you, you don't necessarily have to change the constitution to do that, but you do have to recognize that, um, uh, that Afghanistan now has a constitution that's fit for a monarch or a tyrant in a country that successfully got rid of a whole bunch of monarchs and tyrants. And that many Afghan rulers, including the current one, look upon Amir Abdurrahman as the model that they should have. The only uh, ruler of Afghanistan that created uh, a centralized state ruled it successfully, killed a lot of people, and died peacefully in his bed. Every other Afghan ruler since 1901 has either been exiled or assassinated. Okay. Um, for the entire 20th century. That's, that's, a, that's a tough kind of thing, is that central governments in Afghanistan have had a hard time maintaining themselves uh, over, over time. So what I, but, but the other thing you have to realize is that Afghan ethnic groups are not like Yugoslavia or other places. There's not a single ethnic group or ethnic leader in Afghanistan that's threatened to become independent or to say, why don't us Uzbeks, you know, combine with the Uzbeks across the border? Why not create a big greater Tajikistan? And if you look at uh, Afghanistan's definition of Pashtunistan, it includes Pashtuns in Pakistan. It says nothing about Pashtuns in Afghanistan. Um, so when you're, when, you're, when you're looking at this, you have to realize that Afghanistan is in one sense fortunate. Nobody wants to break the country up. Otherwise it would have broken up already. Um, but at the same time, one of the difficulties that you have is Afghanistan has never had a census. We don't even know how many people live there. So each Pashtuns claim to be a majority. Maybe they are, probably they're a plurality. But every ethnic group claims to about double the percentage that it probably actually is, and then says we're being cheated when they don't. Unless you have 200% of power to distribute, there's not enough for everybody. The other thing too is that groups, and this is true in any country, any group that's been politically dominant and got an unfair share of power, when you impose equality, they say we're cheated. We used to have 70% of the positions and now we have only 50. The other groups say, yeah, but you're only 30% of the population. They say, yeah, but we, you know, we've been cut in half. We are being discriminated against. We can see that with a lot of Donald Trump's followers in the United States is that if you, that having a more diverse country means that we lose. Actually, no, you just get to be equal. Equality is seen as discrimination by groups that have had more than their fair share of power. That's just a tough thing to do. And it's a tough thing in Afghanistan as in any other country, but it's harder when we don't even have any facts on the ground to work with. So that every, every ethnic group can claim whatever it wants. However, we do have one advantage in Afghanistan in some ways. Each ethnic group is a plurality, maybe even a majority in one region of the country. We look at the Pashtuns in the East or Pashtuns in the South, Nobody's saying that they aren't a majority. So I am a great uh, believer in a type of federalism that is that we should focus not on the provinces of Afghanistan, but on the regions of Afghanistan and devolve power to the regions. Doesn't mean break the country up, but it does mean everything shouldn't run out of Kabul, out of, out of Kabul. Um, that there's a lot of commonality economically and political in the four or five regions of Afghanistan. 
So devolve power down to that. So at least people can run their own affairs, um, that they can have people as their governors or others who, are, who, who owe their position to the people that they serve, not to the central government. If you're a centralizer, you say, by God, the country will fall apart. We can't allow that to happen. But as I said, if the country were gonna fall apart, it would already have fallen apart. The reason, one of the reasons it is falling apart, it has fallen apart in the past, is when Kabul becomes too aggressive in terms of demanding everything its way. And then it falls off a cliff. In early April, um, a, a, a couple of years ago, um, Hamid Karzai reportedly told a gathering of parliamentarians in Kabul that he um, that if he came under pressure from foreigners, he might well join the Taliban. Uh, and this remark was widely taken by Western reporters as evidence of Karzai's fickleness or even men mental instability. But analysts inside Afghanistan said that it reflected the rec uh, the, his recognition of Taliban's social uh, solid position in the Pashtun heartland and that uh, and the effect that resistance to foreign influences was a popular political theme within the country. He followed this by calling them his brothers. I mean, how do you see this and what prospects do you see for a productive political dialogue with the Taliban, um, such as the one that Karzai had advocated for? Well, Karzai was the president of a sovereign country. He had the right to tell the Americans to leave, all right? Um, not like Iraq, where actually they had lost their sovereignty. Karzai was, was in a very tough place in that he could see the problems, but was not willing to do anything about them. This follows in the line, unfortunate line, of many rulers that come to power after foreign invasions, is that foreigners tend to like weak leaders in that position. A stronger leader would have said, no, you can't do some of these things. Karzai didn't. That's partially his personality. Maybe it was partially uh, an accurate reflection of how he thought things were, were, were working out. But when he said, my brother's the Taliban, that probably had much more appeal among his fellow Pashtuns than it did from the non-Pashtuns who we're not thinking of those guys as their brothers at all. Um, and even among a lot of Pashtuns, it's which Taliban are we talking about here? Um, so what I would say is that it depends on what Taliban we're talking about. In 2001 and 2002, there were plenty of ex-Taliban that were interested in joining the government. I think the great mistake in Bonn was they were not incorporated at that time to be part of a of a new order. Um, at this time, my question would be, who are we talking about reconciling? With Taliban that are living in Quetta and want their emirate back? Or by people who are in Afghanistan who would just like to see peace? And I remind people to look what happened in 1992 when Najibullah the fell. There were two choices. Some people said, now that Najibullah looks like he's falling, he's going, the commanders inside Afghanistan, particularly Ahmad Shah Massoud, but others, they should form the government. After all, they're in Afghanistan and they're doing the fighting. But then they said, no, we should have the seven party leaders from Peshawar. They should come to Afghanistan. So the outsiders came in and we got the civil war and we got the Taliban. I would say that one of that thing shows is that bringing back people who have been outside of the country for a long time and who are ideologues is a recipe for disaster because they're looking to come back to Afghanistan to grab power. For Afghans that, that are, are tired of war, who are interested in reconciliation, who are inside Afghanistan, and that could have been in 1992 or it can be in 2021, those kind of people probably can come to a reconciliation. But who are we, we, it looks like we're gonna make the same mistake as in 1992 and invite some of these Taliban who have not seen Afghanistan for 20 years. The Afghanistan that they remember no longer exists. It doesn't. If they fly into Kabul, that is not a recognizable city 
from the ruins they left. Nor is the population, its education, its communications. The majority of Afghans today, all right, it's such a young population that the majority of Afghans today knows only about the Taliban from what their parents or their grandparents told them. I mean, those, those guys could be like from Amir Abdurrahman's time or something. I mean, it's like ancient history. There's no personal experience. And yet these people are thinking of coming back saying, we remember what it was like 20 and 30 years ago and we wanna run the place. These are not exactly people who are prone to compromise or who even understand what Afghanistan's problems are gonna be. They didn't do a really great job running the country in the 1990s when they controlled it. And the other thing too is, I don't care what kind of government there's in Afghanistan, if they don't have outside aid to pay for the government, it will collapse. And who are the Taliban's friends? Does Pakistan have the money to pay for an Afghan government and pay for the reconstruction of Afghanistan? So e even if they were of the best will, if they manage to alienate the international community, they will find themselves just as they were in the year 2000 in desperate need of enough money and enough food just to run their government. You sort of pressed on the history of Afghanistan and, and the state building, but you know, since 1747, Afghanistan has been through 226 years of tribal monarch, in 1973, the last king, uh, Zahir Shah, was deposed by his cousin, Daud Khan, uh, where he procla proclaimed himself the first president of the republic in, in the 47 years since 1973. The Afghan state has been a kingdom, a republic, a people's a democratic republic, again a republic, an Islamic state, an Islamic emirate, an interim administration, a transitional Islamic state, and a Islamic Republic, averaging a change of regime more than frequently than every six years. This paints a very difficult picture when it comes to the future of the country, because the past, of course, is a lesson for the future. I mean, what is your understanding of this, and how do you think this approach and this history will reflect Afghanistan moving forward? Well, I would go back, if you focus on the last 40 years, you, you are correct. Afghan, Afghanistan with the fall of Daoud has never been able to get out of a cycle of falling governments of violence and insurgencies. But if we, if we look at Afghanistan, um, and Daoud wasn't that much different than his cousin. I already called himself president, but he had been prime minister before. I was in Kabul in 73 when Dawood took power and all of Zaire Shah's pictures disappeared. And the next day there were Dawood pictures everywhere. And, and I asked, where did you find so many, like, how did all these pictures come up? He says, he was prime minister. We never throw away the picture of a leader. You might be able to use it again. So they put it back up. But the thing is, if we look at it, the great period of violence in Afghanistan was late 1880s into the 1890s with Amir Abdurrahman. But essentially from 1895 until 1929, Afghanistan was at peace. There was a civil war with Amanullah. That civil war lasted nine months and then it was over. There was no insurgency after that. From 1929 to 1978, Afghanistan was at peace. It stayed out of the Second World War. It stayed out of the First World War. And there were no insurgencies in Afghanistan for a half century. So the question is of, of people who look at the past 40 years and say, Afghans, give them a chance, they'll form an insurgency. For 50 years, there was no insurgency in Afghanistan. That was partially because of the way the Musahiban government in the aftermath of, of Amanullah's uh, uh, regime was very careful with how it governed. It practically did nothing, but it was very careful not to overreach. And what we find is governments that overreach in Afghanistan, often with foreign support, those are the ones that tend to produce insurgencies, whether that was uh, uh, the communists. Um, and in the wake of the, the communists, 
with no international aid to support Afghanistan in the 1990s, we got a civil war that could not end. There was no way, they, there was nobody to put to gov a government together. The Americans, I do think, could have created a stable Afghanistan, but didn't recognize they had won the war. They didn't, you seek reconciliation when a war is over, not in the middle of a war. 19, 2002, 2003, you could go anywhere in the country, despite the fact that there were no police, there was no army, there was no fighting in Afghanistan because people have decided the war is over. So opportunities lost. But what it means is that it's, it's not a structural position that, there's, there's, that Afghanistan is a constant land of rebellions. It's, it's governments and their international sponsors who create the conditions that bring this about. So in, in some ways, what I would say is that Afghanistan is, has had a really tough transition <clears throat> from the turmoil that was brought about with the communists taking over that is still not finished. But if we look at the Afghan population, if we look at where they want to go, um, that there's the possibilities with the Cold War over and now that you can trade cross border with Central Asia, with China, um, Afghanistan has an opportunity to fulfill the role that it fulfilled in the past, not being a buffer state between rival great powers, but being a link in a Eurasian transportation system. Afghanistan has always played a, a strong role in that. Afghanistan is rich in resources that can't be developed because of the trouble. But it has, it has a greater possibility for stability than most other countries that, that lack those resources. But I do think it's really important that essentially that foreign interference of all sides needs to cease in Afghanistan so that Afghans can do things themselves. Great. Well, I will now turn to some uh, questions from the audience. There are quite a few. So we'll start with one that I haven't asked myself. And this is if Professor Barfield could touch upon the historical transport, uh, transformation of um, Afghan political parties and their performance, particularly in the post-2001 poli political era, um, just in, in terms of the context of introducing the different groups and political parties in Afghanistan? All right. The most important thing to realize is, and this was true with the 1964 Constitution of Zaire Shah, and it's true the 2004 Constitution now, Afghanistan does not allow the recognition of political parties in elections or in parliament. There are political parties, but in the absence of an institutional framework, they, they tend to follow leaders or you know, individual leaders or ethnic groups because that's the only way you can put it together. Um, neither the king nor Hamid Karzai nor Ashraf Ghani has ever passed the law that recognizes political parties. So when we see 100 people run for a seat in parliament in Kabul, it only takes 10% of the vote to win. If you got a big family, you could win. The way other democracies handle this, parliamentary democracies and others, is that political parties decide who's going to run among themselves. They put up one candidate instead of 30. Similarly, when you organize parliament, how can you organize parliament without recognized political parties? And there are none. Is it any surprise then the parliament runs more or less on ethnic lines or regional lines? because parties have not been legally recognized. If people could run saying, I am the representative of the Azad party, then even if you didn't know their name, you would know, okay, yeah, I'm, a, I'm an Azadi, you know? So yeah, I'll appoint them. We don't. So I would say the major failure of political parties in Afghanistan is because as a deliberate policy, Governments in Afghanistan have refused to let them to organize so that they can participate in an electoral and parliamentary process. Without that, you don't really have political parties in Afghanistan. 
if you did, they would be able to recruit people from all parts of the country. They could become multi-ethnic on the basis of their ideas or on their patronage. But if you don't have that, it reverts back to an older form of politics, which, which essentially runs on region patronage um, and vague ideologies. But there's no need to compromise because that's not how you get elected and that's not how you govern. Great. Um, the second question actually um, sort of presses on some of the things that we discussed, but it's the concept of the 2001 liberal state building in Afghanistan. Um, and that it's been criticized much um, because the concept of state building in Afghanistan hasn't been defined and the formula for it hasn't been very clear. Um, so what is your perspective of this in terms of the failure of state building based on then not being any concise or clear definition of it for Afghanistan? Well, I would say the, the problem is, is less than that. It was the focus on, on building a state administration and not on building a nation. Um, it was, it, it was focused by creating such a highly centralized government whose rulers were not responsible to its people. Um, they, were, they were building a, a state that Amir Abdurrahman could have been proud of. And that wasn't particularly popular in the late 19th century with many people in Afghanistan. And it's totally inappropriate for the Afghanistan of today. So when we talk about state building, uh, we need to separate out the administrative part. Do the courts work? Do the police work? Does the bureaucracy provide services? And the political part, who determines state policy? Where should the country be going? Those are two different things. Uh, but I think in Afghanistan, the focus of the definition of the state is the power part. Because historically, and one of the great improvements, innovations after 2001, it's the first time Afghans ever chose their own leaders. As much as the policy may have been flawed, that was the first time ever, ever, ever. Um, even that the people said, oh yeah, we used to use loya jirgas. A loya jirga was used to um, uh, empower Ahmed Shah Durrani in 1747. It was next used to choose a leader, Nader Shah, 1929. And that was not a national one. It was his, his soldiers elected him Shah twice. So the idea that, yeah, Afghans hold loya jirgas to do this. Leaders in Afghanistan were never chosen by loya jirgas. So getting the entire population that, uh, to approve of a leader was something really, really new. The difficulty was beyond that, um, there was little or no attempt to actually create a liberal state. I do not consider Afghanistan to be a liberal state. Uh, it's an autocratic state, maybe an electoral autocratic state, but its structure is extremely autocratic. Does the Supreme Court have the right to declare a law unconstitutional? Never done it. Has parliament ever been able to override, whether it's uh, Ghani or Karzai, what the president has done? It seems to be still very much stuck in the idea, sort of in the mentality of a royal, uh, a royal autocracy. Um, and that can be very successful if your autocrat is a brilliant ruler. It can be very bad if the center fails because there's no, there's, 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 there's nothing, there's no intervening institutions to protect the fall. When you talked about the collapse of governments, if everything is Kabul centric, then if, if there's trouble in Kabul, there's trouble in the whole country. United States, we were less concerned when we saw those idiots attack the Congress because number one, they were idiots, but number two, our power is distributed. Even if they sat in Congress overnight, it would not give them power. Washington is, is the capital of the United States, but it's not the center of the United States. Kabul is. So unfortunately, Kabul politics is almost always Afghan national politics. And I think that needs to change 
because the regions of the country now have their own cities, they have their own educated population, there needs to be more of a distribution of power. And that actually provides a safety net in a way. It allows the center to make mistakes without having the whole country fall apart. Great. Um, another question that we've received from the audience is that um, you mentioned that under the US occupation, Afghanistan remains sovereign, but Iraq mm. lost its sovereignty. Um, would you please clarify how you see this to be different between two countries and what determines sovereignty in your opinion and, and how that makes the two countries different under the US occupation? Number one, when Afghanistan, when the Taliban were driven from power, there were fewer than 400 Americans on Afghan soil. All right. So when, when Kabul was taken after the Taliban fell, it was by the Northern Alliance. When Iraq fell, it was an entire American army that went in there. There may have been American air power, there was certainly American money, but the political deals, the fighting on the ground was Afghans. And Afghanistan at the Bonn Accord and others, this is partially legal, but the Americas never stepped in even for a short period of time to say, we are the rulers of Afghanistan while you are putting it together. That, that literally Afghanistan never lost its sovereignty. It never lost the right to tell the Americans to take a hike. Now, there may have been good reasons why they didn't do that, but if you looked at the American representative in Iraq, who on his own dissolved the entire Iraqi army the Americans never took that role in Afghanistan. They may have dominated it, and this was similar to what other powers have done in Afghanistan, but Afghanistan maintained its, its rights as a sovereign nation. To implement those rights, however, that's not easy. And, and you would have needed a different kind of leader probably than, than Karzai. And even then it would have been difficult. But technically it was different. There was no American occupying army in Afghanistan. First three years of Afghanistan's post 2001, I believe there were fewer than 14,000 foreign troops in Afghanistan and almost all of them were in Kabul. So that's a very different thing. They're comparing that with an American army of occupation that was actively fighting that was running the government um, and essentially you know, controlled the countryside. We didn't see large numbers of American troops come in until the Obama administration and they were withdrawn fairly quickly. So it's, it's a different kind of occupation. It's, it's a type of occupation Afghans have experienced before with foreign powers is um, you don't always need troops on the ground to have your influence be predominant, but it's a very different type of, of occupation between, between, between the two countries. So um, that's, it, it, it's partially for that is that whether Afghanistan should have or could have taken more advantage of its ability to be sovereign is another question, but it kept more of its institutions intact, just as in the past, it could have been dominated by British, the British in India, but there were no British in Afghanistan. So it, 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 was, it, was, it, was, it was a type of imperial influence that Afghans, Afghans knew and understood, but is, is quite different than physical occupation in which a foreign power essentially takes over your government and runs it itself. Great. Um, you've, you've sort of touched upon this already, but I think someone wants a bit more information on the idea of federalism in Afghanistan, particularly considering the, the geopolitics of, of the area, um, the complexity and the, the sort of the relationship between its neighbors. Um, there have been a few leaders in Afghanistan, for instance, um, the late Ahmad Shah Massoud's son, who's been advocating for federalism, and right. a few others like, such as Latif Pedram, um, who've sort of pressed upon the concept that this current structure of Afghanistan, the constitution, none of it seems to work, and it hasn't in the past. Why is it, in your opinion, that 
none of this is picking any sort of it's not sort of gaining publicity or um, being picked up on by international uh, the international community or receiving any support um, so that a final solution is made in terms of distributing power across the country well two reasons foreigners foreigners like one-stop shopping um, if you can deal with one ruler in Kabul that's great do you want to have to go to five different regions to bring, you know, it's, for them, it's easy. So they tend to like it. America has the oldest federal constitution in the world. How come overseas it's always in favor of building ever more centralized autocracies? It's probably a wish list of American presidents. They wish they could do that. Um, but I would say within Afghanistan, the powers that be have no interest at all at seeing power devolved that would change the entire dynamic of how the country is ruled. And if you're the president, why would you be willing to give up the power to run everything? What do you get out of it? It'll probably cost you your job. Um, but the entire structure that's, that's built in which Kabul is the central of everything, you have a lot of people that, that lose from that. You also have, and this was particularly important in 2001, the fear has gone out. If you give power to these people, the place will fall apart. In Afghanistan, look at the civil war in, in, in the 1990s, at a period, or early periods, people say, that's what will happen. So you use fear. But it, it's important to realize that federalism does not mean like four different countries in Afghanistan. What it means is why should the Ministry of Education be responsible for every elementary school in Afghanistan? Why not devolve that down to the provinces of the region? Let them hire the, the teachers. Let them pay the teachers. Let them collect taxes for that. Why not let the central government focus on things like national defense, security, uh, running the treasury, really big things and devolve stuff that should be done locally down to the locals. That way, it would take a lot of the administrative pressure off of Kabul. If your school is not working, you go to the governor, he says, hey, this is the ministry in Kabul that did this, not me. And he's right. But if you were a governor and people were saying, why do we have lousy schools? and you are responsible for the schools, and you have to be elected by those people, maybe you'll do something about it. Or maybe the voters will, will throw you out. But the bigger thing is, and again, don't focus on provinces, focus on regions. Each of the regions has, some are more conservative, some are more liberal. Policies that would work very well in Kandahar might not work very well in Mazar Sharif. And I sit in the United States and I'm in Massachusetts. It's a very liberal part of the country in New England. We are part of the same country as Mississippi and Alabama. Um, if we had a president who say George Bush put a Texan in our governor's office if Barack Obama put a guy from Chicago and Mississippi, we'd have an insurgency too. All right. In Massachusetts, we will arrest you for carrying a gun in the street. In Texas, they think that's a really great thing. They don't get in our affairs. We don't get in their affairs. We have a national government, a Supreme Court. We have national laws that they say there are certain things that all states rules they must recognize. There's certain rights you cannot abridge. But if those people want to live that way, let them live that way as long as they're not violating fundamental rights. In Afghanistan, you have one law to rule them all. So what might be a very obvious and popular thing in Kandahar is not necessarily obvious and popular in Helmand. So why not have the central government be more or less the referee? And if the Taliban is relatively popular in Southern Afghanistan, let them run for election. Let them be responsible for government. If, if they represent the values of the people there, let them participate in government. 
The problem is right now, Afghanistan lives in a zero sum political world. Whoever seizes Kabul takes the entire government and then thinks it has the ability to impose itself on the rest of the country. So we had a radical communist government replaced by a radical Islamist government. That's, that's head spinning. Okay, each one of them actually represented philosophies that were popular among some groups in Afghanistan, but not all groups in Afghanistan. And their belief that they can impose their will on everybody has created trouble in Afghanistan. So what I'm saying is like devolve some of it, you know, make what happens in Kabul less central to people's lives. When I was in Afghanistan in the 70s, people would listen on the radio and they'd hear this and they'd say, oh, and they think, they said, you think Dawood's a communist? So I don't know, he says, but they weren't worried about it as long as nothing showed up in their neighborhood. And the one thing from, you know, Zaire Shah or Daoud was nothing was gonna show up in your neighborhood and the roads were safe. So people weren't, you know, they listen to what we hear on the radio, but what they really was concerned was this is gonna affect my life. And one of the things that happened in the 70s and the 90s and in the 2000s, is stuff that out of, has come out of Kabul has affected people's lives. And so we've got to find a way to bring them back in. So that's sort of more acceptable to them. We'll take two more questions and then we'll start to, to wrap up. Um, one question sort of presses a little bit more on the Taliban. Um, they've emerged, they've changed um, in one important way, um, this sort of audience member mentions that they're now willing to accept foreign aid than they were in the past. In fact, it seems to be one of the one source of leverage the US has on the Taliban. Um, you've written quite a lot about how these aid dynamics affect rulers and government legitimacy. How might this dynamic affect future lit, the, the future legitimacy of the Taliban and their ruling strategy? Well, the Taliban may have decided that they're willing to accept foreign aid. You actually have to look back. It was the UN that fed Kabul when they ruled Kabul in the 90s. They couldn't do it. Uh, you know, they and the UN were arguing constantly, but nevertheless, you know, they helped each other. The problem is not, the Taliban may have recognized that you need foreign aid to keep the country running. So I think, okay, Americans, you can aid us. The problem is looking at the Taliban, do you think American congressmen are going to pass billions of dollars of aid when the Taliban announced that they're closing girls' schools? that they're not gonna they keep women out of, of jobs and that, you know, that they wanna join an international jihadist movement. I mean, politically, it would be very difficult to get billions of dollars out of the United States or Britain to support the recreation of an Islamic emirate that whose values go against practically everything that those two countries stand for. You're not going to get any money from them. Not enough to run the country. So, so it's great that they've understood that, yeah, we actually need this. The crisis would be, congratulations, you now own a government. Unfortunately, there's no gas in the tank and we don't know where to get any. Um, yeah, the Taliban have grown more sophisticated on that, but they, they have to understand this is, a, this is a mutual relationship. And their best ally is Pakistan and Pakistan is broke. So if you're, if you're gonna pick your patrons, pick ones that can provide patronage. And I think that's the fundamental weakness of the Taliban, which if they do understand, they need to be much more sophisticated in terms of making themselves more acceptable to the international community because they need the support of that international community any government in Kabul needs the support of that international community and will until Afghanistan can develop its resources, which has been promised for the last hundred years. But the resources are there. At some point, yeah, a government could break free of that. But at the moment, uh, there's no government in the next five or 10 years that, that could survive without substantial uh, international aid. Um, 
Thank you, Professor. I think we'll wrap up with this one, and it is quite a timely one. What do you think about the upcoming Turkey summit? And do you think it's workable? And what mistakes made in bon the Bonn conference in 2001 should be avoided in, in, in Turkey? I don't think it's going to work in, in, in Turkey. Um, I'll have an article with my colleague, Nemat Najumi, maybe in the next week or so um, on U.S. Institute of Peace website. We've got a proposal that, that fundamentally, uh, this is not a bond situation because you're not wrapping up a war that's finished. All right, so that's not going to work. But um, you, you, you need to be much more multilateral. And that's not just bringing people to Turkey or visiting Moscow. Um, there needs to be a large, the, the, UN, the UN has played a, a strong role on these things in the past as an organizer, even, even getting the Soviets out. Diego Cordovez played an important role. There was a Geneva Accord. Um, there's enough, I believe there's, there, there's enough accord among rival states that even though China, Russia, and the United States don't get along on most issues, and this even includes Iran, they all fundamentally want to see a stable Afghanistan. And the problem for these other countries is if the Americans leave, there could be a problem for them. That gives them incentives to have stability so the Americans can get out. Um, so I would, I would work this up on a, on a much more multilateral platform so that you can bring people together um, so that some pressure can be put on Pakistan, not by the United States, but by countries like China. Um, and that countries like Iran can also participate. And that it won't, it, it won't have this bilateral US label on it. We may have Donald Trump gone, but American unilateralism under his administration, we still have a hangover from that. The other thing is the EU needs to be brought into this. People forget there are more NATO troops, non-American troops in Afghanistan under NATO than there are American troops. The EU has provided a tremendous amount of aid in Afghanistan. Um, and countries like Norway with the Oslo Accords and others dealing with the Palestinians, the Europeans are probably better at pulling together a neutral place to pull people together than either Turkey or Moscow or Doha. Um, mm -hmm. Europeans have a big stake in, 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 in this both the military side, because they're part of NATO, many of them, but also they've invested a lot in Afghanistan. They, they, they are capable of providing a lot of aid. So one of the things I would do is, is focus on Europe's role uh, in this. That sort of includes Britain, even though Britain Brexited. Um, nevertheless, it's sort of part of this, 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 this larger thing is when mediation, because I've spent some time studying mediation and arbitration in Afghanistan, the mediator and arbitrator doesn't walk in and say, you win, you lose, let's eat. He talks to both sides, he convinces both sides, and he, he talks about the necessity to come together, even if you don't like each other, to get a resolution. We need somebody like that. That's probably not going to be an American. It's probably not going to be Khalilzad uh, to do that. That's why it'd be good to have somebody from the UN that could go visit everybody, put it together, create a deal that the UN may not have the power to enforce, but it can broker. And then if that's the case, if, if you can stop the outside interference, that would empower the Afghans themselves to negotiate, knowing that neither side had enough military capacity to take out the other. So it's a complicated process, but I would, I would say right now the United States is, is still too bilateral. Um, it needs to be much more multilateral to be successful. Well, thank you so much, uh, Professor Barfield, uh, for your time. Uh, I'd like to first thank you as someone from
uh, a British Afghan background, a, a new generation, a young woman. I'm incredibly grateful for your contribution to the debate on Afghanistan. Uh, there is definitely a huge gap when it comes to understanding the country, particularly from the outside. And work and expertise like yourself plays a huge role. So I'm very thankful, uh, first of all. And second of all, um, your, your answers definitely painted a clear, more clearer picture for us here today in terms of the history of Afghanistan and the direction it's moving. Unfortunately, and 42 years of conflict and now 20, 20 years of international presence, and yet still there doesn't seem to be a solution to the grievances and the problems that Afghans face in Afghanistan. And I agree with much of the sentiments that you've shared. So I do hope that this discussion will influence and impact other uh, others who've not only the audience, but hopefully once we've, we've put it up, it will influence and impact people's uh, ideas uh, and the way they approach Afghanistan. We do hope to have you with us again in, in the future. Um, again, thank you for your help and your support. And I hope that um, this, uh, this discussion uh, was as interesting for you as it was for us. Um, and uh, we'll speak to you again very soon. Thank you so much. Well, thank you very much. Have a good evening. Bye-bye.